Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. Welcome to the second webinar of the Tracker Use Academy uh, conducted by the HISP Asia Hub. So uh, in today's webinar, which uh, we hope to do in like uh, one to two hours, we'll focus on uh, introducing you to the uh, major features which are available in Tracker, the DHIS2 Tracker, which covers both the, the web and the Android. And also to uh, um, show you some new features that we are currently implementing in the latest versions of the DHIS2. So uh, uh, this uh, two hours webinar, we mainly try to focus uh, on introducing these concepts uh, by using a presentation. And towards the latter part, we will have a question and answer session where uh, we will be able to uh, take a few of the questions that you have and uh, probably go a bit deep uh, into these features uh, based on your questions. So uh, if you have any questions about what we are presenting um, uh, in the first one hour, uh, please uh, ask them in the chat so that uh, we can take them up uh, once the presentation is over. Right. So I hope we can start. Right. So uh, the objectives of this uh, webinar is to describe what DHIS2 Tracker is and to understand how DHIS2 Tracker can be modified based on your country's requirements or your organization's requirements, and to describe examples of how DHIS2 Tracker is used in different countries, so in, uh, in different programs, and to describe the features of the DHIS2 Tracker. Now, first of all, what is DHIS2 Tracker? So hope you have, uh, ha you have some idea about what DHIS2 is used in the aggregate context as well as events probably. And if you, um, I assume all, all, all of you must have had some experience in DHIS2 Tracker or have uh, followed our Fundamentals Academy. Uh, so what DHIS2 Tracker does is to allow for the collection and analysis of identifiable, individual and longitudinal data. So this is how it differs from the, the DHIS2 events concept that we, we mostly focus in our Fundamentals Academy. So here we are talking about identifiable individual and longitudinal data. This means uh, we can create unique shared records that relate several different services to the unique record we are tracking. Uh, I know this uh, description sounds a bit abstract, but if you can focus on what we are showing here, in the screenshots, you can see that here we have a profile of a person named uh, Brian Jeffrey. So what we are trying to do uh, as a basic component in DHS2 Tracker is to register an individual. It could be an individual or it could be an any entity. Why I say that is like commonly DHS2 Tracker we are using in our, in our uh, practical use cases to track people longitude. But it doesn't mean that we cannot use DHS2 Tracker to uh, track, say, for example, commodities like laboratory samples or, say, logistics, uh, some equipments, right? So all these things, for all these use cases, we can use DHS2 Tracker. So uh, when we register an individual or an entity, we can collect some, uh, some properties of that individual at the, at the point of registration. So, for example, as you can see here, uh, when we are registering this person, we are capturing some properties or attributes of that person, such as the age, gender, country of residence, um, etc. So this is what the tracker is capable of registering uh, an, an entity or a commodity or a person. And then we can track them longitudinally across a time period. Say, for example, if this person is registered in a health program, uh, then he may be having follow-up visits or like say laboratory visits. So at each of these visits, we can capture uh, different data uh, uh, fields, such as uh, some information attached to data elements across uh, time. So this is what the DHS2 tracker is capable of doing. So uh, in this presentation, we will go through some of the examples of uh, what we can do using the DHS2 tracker features. The features unique to the DHS2 tracker are we can schedule visits for various services and send them automated reminders based on these scheduled visits. So these visits could be say pending clinic visits. So if we have a, if you run a clinic in our health program and if you want, um, 
people to be sent reminders. It could be SMS reminders or email reminders. This is possible using DHS to track. And tracking missed and upcoming visits. So in our clinic, if we have a list of patients who have upcoming visit, or like uh, probably we have another group of people who have missed their visits, using the tracker, we can track them. And we can also create reports displaying both individually identifiable and aggregated data. So you know very well, DHS2 is really powerful in creating aggregate reports. And using Tracker, we can even uh, uh, expand it, it further by creating reports based on individual data. We can also support data quality and decision support during the data collection. Uh, if you are familiar with any health or non-health uh, program, you know like that uh, the point of data capture is the place where you can make most of the mistakes and it can really affect your data quality. So DHS2 Tracker is capable of applying some uh, decision support mechanisms as well as things like validation rules at the uh, point of data capture to en enhance the data quality. And it can also send notification or alerts based on data with, uh, within each individual event. So uh, let me take for an example, uh, we want to send an SMS reminder or SMS notifications once a COVID-19 vaccination has been completed, a vaccine event, say a first dose or second uh, dose event was completed at the vaccination center. The person needs to get SMS alert this is possible using DHS to track. I assume you can all hear me because uh, I'm seeing in chat there are some uh, some participants having issues. Could someone confirm that you can hear me? Yes, great, thank you. And the tracker is not at all about data capture. We can also analyze the data using the DHS2 tracker. So, uh, I mean, there are different ways of doing that. So for example, all the data we collect for an individual level is automatically aggregated based on predefined parameters. So these predefined parameters we can configure when we are uh, customizing the DHS2 tracker. So for example, if we register, uh, a set of people to a health facility or a vaccination center. And if you want to get aggregate dashboard, so you are familiar with what, uh, what the aggregate analysis can do in DHIS2. So the same things that we can do based on the tracker data. So once the data is captured at the health facility or the vaccination center, we are able to generate aggregate analysis such as dashboards, which are available to the vaccination center or a higher level such as district or the province. So this, this will happen automatically once you configure the track. And both track, uh, aggregate and uh, individual data can be viewed and analyzed within the DHIS2 using the built-in tools. So the built-in tools that we have uh, include the dashboards, tables, charts, and maps. So this is something very similar to the analysis that we are doing in the aggregate component of DHIS2. So it's just, it's just a matter of configuring the tracker uh, to kind of build the aggregate analysis based on the individual data. And also you can export the data that is collected in the tracker to an analytic platform of your choice. So it could be a simple uh, Excel export, uh, and even we can create some advanced integrations using the DHIS2 Web API, which we are not too much focusing in this academy, but of course we will definitely show how to take data at, as Excel. Data ownership. So data ownership is a major concern when it comes to the tracker or case-based data. So the ownership comes at uh, different dimensions. Uh, one thing is the ownership of the data within the system, as in like who can see the data, who can edit the data. So the DHS2 tracker contains some granular sharing settings that allows the administrators to define which organization levels, which organization groups, and which individual users or user groups can access specific kinds of data stored within a tracker program. So with that, we can kind of restrict which set of users have access to which data 
and which organization units will be able to have access to the data. So this way, the ownership of the personally identifiable data is kind of uh, preserved and the confidentiality is ensured. And on a different dimension, the hosting of each DHS2 instance is handled by the owner organization. Say for example, um, the Ministry of Health of your country is the owner organization which will be hosting the DHS2 instance and they can define their own parameters for data storage in, according, in accordance with the local laws and privacy concerns as per the country requirements. And whether uh, it's, it's uh, hosted locally within the Ministry of Health or ICT uh, department's premises or in the cloud. Um, no outside entity, and I must mention, including the DHS to software developers, uh, can access the data unless that data is specifically granted by the owner of the database. So that's how it is work. This is free and open source software, but it has been designed in such a way that uh, only you or your organization can access this data uh, once configured properly. So now that I have mentioned some, uh, uh, some overview of features and capabilities of DHS2 Tracker, how are you going to customize it? Uh, the information and the workflows that are defined within the Tracker are completely customizable. So dhs 2 Tracker is a kind of abstract concept and a set of tools, and you have to configure it uh, as per your country's or the organization's requirements. So this is what you are trying to master uh, from this uh, Tracker course. So this course is specifically about the uh, features of Tracker and how to use the Tracker. But we have another DHS2 Online Academy, uh, which is for the Tracker configuration, where we will be going into depths of understanding how to configure the Tracker program uh, based on your country's requirements. And to facilitate this, we have a number of standard digital packages, which are also available as a starting point that can be freely modified based on local context. We understand that uh, DHS2 tracker configuration could be a, a bit of a difficult task when you are, uh, when you are new to DHS2. But uh, uh, now we have also seen that most of the countries are having a similar set of requirements. Say for example, almost all the countries in health domain, they have uh, the immunization packages, EPHIV, malaria, uh, uh, malaria programs, so all these programs uh, tend to have kind of a generic set of requirements and generic set of uh, data collection forms. So what has uh, what uh, the DHS2 team has done is to make this con uh, a kind of concept called packages. It's a, a kind of a bundle of configuration which you can download and install on your DHS2 system. So once you do that, you can get your DHS2 tracker program, say for example, TV up and running in, in, in no time. But the challenge is like, if your country uh, has some data collection forms, which kind of uh, deviate a bit from the standard package uh, data collection forms we have in the, the, the DHS2 standard uh, package distributions, you might have to configure or edit them a bit. But uh, of course, once you uh, follow our DHS2 tracker configuration academy, or else you can even uh, follow the documentation, uh, this is not uh, so much of a difficult task. You can definitely do it. So these packages are, are developed based on the inputs from the partner organizations, including WHO, CDC, UNICEF, Gavi, et cetera. And the scale of DHS2 tracker. So something that we really have to be concerned about is whether these, uh, these tracker programs are scalable. So as of now, DHS2 Tracker is used in more than 75 countries and Indian states. And these countries and organizations which are already using DHS2 aggregate, they can leverage their existing infrastructure to implement tracker programs without needing any additional software platform. So what I want to say is, if you have a DHS2 Tracker configured, uh, sorry, DHS2 aggregate configured for your country, and you are deciding that you should uh, now um, try to implement DHS2 Tracker, you won't be needing any additional software. But perhaps you might have to consider like uh, what will be the resources, the hardware resources that uh, you, you need to have uh, in your hosting environment. So this is something that you will have to be concerned about because especially when you are trying to uh, go for a national level tracker. But again, this is a kind of a stepwise process. 
So you can see uh, uh, based on your scale, you can even, uh, you might have to scale up your hardware resources as well. But other than that, software wise, you won't need anything else. So the DHS2 tracker is in fact a collection of different co-apps and features. Now we have a set of applications for data collection. So these include for the web version, DHS2 capture app and the DHS2 tracker capture. And for Android, we have the uh, DHS2 Android capture, mainly for data collection. And we have some data outputs uh, applications or softwares um, or basically applications within the DHS2 core software, such as charts, tables, maps, and dashboards. Now, every release of DHS2 involves updates to these tools. And um, uh, we will also, in this presentation, we will talk about some new features that have been incorporated to these applications. So this is something that uh, you will have to be concerned about, uh, especially like if you are active on DHS2 community, or if you are kind of focused about different updates that are sent out from DHS2, you will get to know what will be the, the latest features that will be included in the next release of DHS2. So depending on that, you can decide when your country needs to update to the next version to get the best out of the latest features um, which are included in the track applications of DHS2. So that is why being an open source uh, software and uh, having open source community, you need to be a bit agile and um, check the updates uh, of the latest features which will be released in time to come so that you can plan and um, uh, advocate your ministries of health or the organizations when you can plan to update the latest version of the DHS2. Right, so next we will try to go into uh, the features which are available in, in each of these core applications. So first, we will uh, uh, discuss uh, on the DHS2 capture applications and DHS2 tracker capture applications, which are available in the web version of the DHS2. Right, so DHS2 capture app, uh, you must have definitely seen it, is an application that has uh, undergone several versions of uh, development over the last, uh, across the last few uh, DHS2 version updates. So as of now, the capture application is, uh, uh, is able to register new tracked entity instances and enroll them into uh, the programs. And also you can search tracked entity instances using the tracker capture. So if you are new to um, the DHS2 tracker concept, you can think of a tracked entity instance uh, as a person. So basically we can uh, register persons into tracker programs using the CAPTCHA, and also we can search persons uh, uh, using this application. And also you can list and filter uh, the people uh, who are enrolled in tracker programs. So these are the main things that, are, that we can do using the, tracker, uh, using the DHS2 CAPTCHA application. Um, so uh, in the next few slides, we will be demonstrating uh, 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 some screenshots and the functionalities which are possible in each of these applications. So the CAPTCHA application uh, is possible uh, uh, using the CAPTCHA application. Traditionally, we were able to uh, create events and capture event-related data. So this you must be familiar if you have been using CAPTCHA application. This was what the CAPTCHA application was uh, conventionally available, to, uh, uh, was possible to do. And now, of course, we have, other than this, we have integrated the tracker data capture. So you can capture data related to a tracker program. So as you can see here, we have the child program, which, uh, which is available at this Gellahun uh, Community Health Center. And there we can even capture uh, some enrollment uh, information that we capture when we uh, register a person uh, into this program. So this is possible in the CAPTCHA application. And in addition, uh, the application is able to generate pattern-based identifications. So for example, if you can see here, we have uh, the unique ID that the system has generated for this person. So now DHS2 is able to, uh, when we are configuring the DHS2 tracker program, we can 
define the patterns. Say, for example, as you can see here, we have uh, in this example 08-2021-DD18333. So here, this is a kind of a, uh, this uh, this ID is following a generic format, which uh, which are delimited by the dashes. So this happens based on the configuration of the tracker program. So when we are configuring the DHS2 tracker, we can dis, uh, we can define what is the pattern a unique ID unique ID should follow. So once that happens, when every time a person tries to uh, register a new track entity instance the number is automatically generated. And this is possible using DHIS2. And in addition, the DHIS2 is able to identify the duplicates when a new person is being registered. Say for example, because uh, especially in large scale trackers, there is a high chance that a same person can be registered again in a different health facility or even in the same health facility um, uh, by mistake. So to prevent that, we now have, uh, this has been uh, available in the uh, last few versions as well, but in Capture, it is possible uh, to detect a duplicate registration uh, at the point of uh, the data entry. Right. So next, we will introduce you the uh, application, the front-end application that EHIS2 has been uh, conventionally using uh, to register and track and record uh, individual person's data. So this application is Tracker Capture. You may be familiar with it, but if you are not familiar, I will briefly mention what you can do using the DHS2 Tracker Capture. So DHS2 Tracker Capture is the principal application that has been available on DHS2 to capture tracker-related data. So using that application, you can register persons and you can capture uh, the information for different events. So these events could be considered as uh, follow-up visits in a clinic setting or a, a, a laboratory visit and uh, the data that, are, that we capture uh, for a laboratory request. So this can be anything. So all this information can be captured by using the tracker capture application of DHIS2. So as you can see here, what you're seeing here is uh, called uh, uh, the tracked entity dashboard. Uh, or you can even think of this as a person's dashboard uh, in the DHS2 tracker. So here we can see what the person um, is enrolled to which program. It could be a child health program, and it will also uh, mention what are the other programs this person has registered to. Say, for example, a person could be registered to COVID surveillance program, TB program, malaria program at the same time. Or even it will uh, show what are the previous programs that person has enrolled to before? And in addition, we also have in the tracker, uh, track entity dashboard, uh, a, a, a component where we are capturing data. So as you can see here towards the uh, left lower part, the tracker data entry widget is where we are capturing uh, the data uh, at the health facilities. And in addition, Towards the right side, you can see there is a particular widget to uh, enter or edit the profile information, which has been already captured at the registration, and also to show the relationship. Relationship as in like what we mean by relationships in DHS2 is like what are uh, who are the other persons this person is related to. So uh, this could, I mean, uh, uh, I don't mean it is like a, a family relationship kind of like, uh, Sibling, no, not like that. But like uh, when we are capturing data uh, in health programs, it could be like uh, 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 in, say for example, if I take the COVID as an example, we can register a person for COVID surveillance or COVID follow-up. And if we also have a, a few other programs, say if we have a one program for contact tracing, and what we can do is like if, another person, person B is registered in the contact tracing program, we can create a link between the person A, who we are displaying in this tracker program, and the person B uh, with the relationship uh, called he has been in contact with. So this is something generic that we uh, describe as relationship in DHIS2. So we will talk in depth about what these relationships are uh, during our course. So in summary, using the tracker capture, we can review the track entity dashboard and we can review the program indicators 
like program indicator, as you can see here, it could be the person's age, which is automatically calculated based on the date of birth, which is captured at the registration and today's date. So we can review the indicators and feedback. We can manage all enrollments of that particular person. We can manage relationships and we can even uh, enter event data for track meetings. Right, so we will quickly go through a few of the features which are available in the Factor Capture application. Uh, so one thing is like we can compare repeatable events during data entry. So if you are new to DHS2 Tracker, you may be wondering what we mean by repeatable events. So um, let's focus on this example. So this uh, example is from a, a antenatal care program. So in the antenatal care program in health services, we have the first visit where we capture a series of information. So, so here um, we can see in the box number one, the person has already attended the first antenatal care visit where we have captured a lot of information. And after the first visit, what we usually have is follow-up events. So in these follow-up events, we can have actually many follow-up events uh, during the course of a pregnancy. So in most of uh, these events, we are capturing the same information, but this capture happens at various visits. Like we may capture uh, some information in the third month, say six months, I mean, likewise, right? So, but it's the same information. It's just that we are tracking that information longitude. So what can happen is like if uh, the patient comes for the second follow-up visit, it might be uh, important for the healthcare worker to have a quick glance at what was, uh, what was happening in the previous follow-up visit. So this is possible um, in, in DHS to uh, track a capture using this compare repeatable events uh, where, as you can see here, now we are capturing the data for the uh, antenatal care visit two, where we have all these boxes. And uh, on to the left side, we can see what were the information that were captured for the first visit. So always the health data enter, the person who is doing the data entry, he can um, compare the data as he's uh, entering data to the data source. So this can come really handy and to prevent some data quality related errors at the point of data capture. And of course, DHS2 Tracker has an advanced concept called sharing. So what we mean by sharing is uh, using this sharing concept in DHS2, we can define which user sees what data, which user has access to which data. So this is a very useful feature to ensure the privacy and confidentiality of this case-based data. So uh, there are so many concepts uh, in the sharing, which is sharing concepts is a broad thing, which I'm not going to go into too much of detail, but I will just show you a few screenshots of uh, uh, what is available and what you can do using the sharing concept in DHIS2. So using the metadata and data sharing concept, we can control who can see the registered individuals. So for example, um, as you can see on this screenshot, uh, we can register a new person by default into the uh, in the capture pro uh, in the capture application right that's the default uh, 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 functionality of the capture but like if we don't want a particular user or a particular uh, group of users to register new persons but we just want them to weave uh, the registered people we can do that so if that that's how it is how the tracker program is configured you'll be able to see as in this screenshot below, like when that person tries to uh, register a, a, a new new um, person, he'll be able to, uh, he will be displayed a message saying you don't have access, right? So this is not only uh, applicable to registration, you can also do it for the specific program stages. So what we mean by program stages is like, say for example, in the previous uh, uh, um, example, we took about antenatal care, the follow-up visit. So we can decide, uh, we can define when we are configuring the DHIS2, whether a person will not be able to see any information at all related to the follow-up event, or he will only have view access to the follow-up information, or he can actually uh, you know, enter information um, for the follow-up stage. 
So this is all configurable in DHIS2. So as you can see here, um, for this ANC registration, this person is able to enter data. That's why all these boxes are white and you can nicely see that uh, the person has entered data. And if the person is only having wave access, this is how he will be able to see. He will be able to see the data, but all the data entry fields will be grayed out and um, you only will uh, see the data, but you can't enter or modify any data. So that's uh, kind of the configuration we can achieve by data sharing uh, in DHIS2. And in addition, this can be even further expanded so that even within the analysis application, we can define who is able to see the data. This can come very handy in case we want only the facility people or people in uh, you know, healthcare institutes where the actual data capture happens for them to get a line list of persons, but to prevent someone who is at the district or provincial or national level trying to generate a list of very sensitive patient uh, personally identified information. So we can prevent it by configuring it in such a way that inside the analysis application, who or which user group is able to see the granular level data. This is possible in DHS to track, uh, tracker. And of course, uh, you can always have a persistent top bar while entering data. So what I mean by persistent top bar is this, uh, the bar here, right at the top, the horizontal gray bar, where you are seeing the first name, last name, birth date, and city. So uh, why this becomes handy is like this information that we are displaying in this um, screenshot are uh, information uh, or the attributes that we are capturing at the registration. But when we subsequently enter data at the health facilities related to the uh, various stages, like uh, say, for example, a follow-up visit, usually we don't tend to see uh, the attributes that we captured at the registration. But just to clarify whether am I entering data to the correct person, it's very useful to have this information displayed uh, right at the top, as you can see here. So this is uh, possible in DHS2 Tracker, and this is what we mean by having a persistent top bar, which is configurable. And another very useful feature, which is uh, currently, I feel, underutilized, is this concept called breaking the glass. This again is a functionality uh, which has been available, uh, if I can recall correctly, from DHS2 version 2.29. It has been there for a couple of years now. Uh, it's a functionality, again, to ensure the privacy and confidentiality security related uh, issues. So what we mean by breaking the glass is typically a person who is ac having access, a data entry user who is having access to his institute was to his vaccination center, to his uh, 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 health facility, may be required to have uh, uh, access to another patient who has been registered in, or, or been uh, generally followed up in another health facility. So this is something that we might have to uh, allow in our routine operations. But then again, this can have some privacy concerns in some setups where why this user from another health facility is having access to another to a, to a person's information who is being followed up at a, at a different health facility. So to avoid that, you can configure DHIS2 where if a data entry user tries to search a person registered outside the scope of his organization unit, right? Uh, but still wants to have a look up that person's information and probably enter some information to that person, we can kind of prompt a, a screen like this where that uh, data entry user will have to mention a reason why he is accessing that person's information. So it is logged into DHIS2. Uh, he, I mean, like we can even configure whether like, say for example, we have some uh, configurable options as mentioned here. It could be open, audited, protected or closed. In, in, in the event of uh, uh, configuration as a closed, he will not be able to ac actually open that record. Open, you, uh, if it is configured as open, you can, without entering any reason or anything, you can um, look up that information and enter data. But if it is audited or protected, you will be prompted to enter the reason, 
why you are searching uh, uh, patient's information outside the scope of your organization unit. So these kind of uh, features are already available in DHIS2. And of course, audited data values. This again is regarding the privacy and security. So, I mean, again, I'm emphasizing because this uh, I mean, DHIS2 tracker always deals with case-based information. That is why we have all these features and that's again why we are demonstrating them in this webinar. So we can track and keep an audit log of the changes that happens to the attributes and the data elements. So attributes are the properties that we uh, configure or, or uh, enter when we are registering a person. Uh, data elements are the information we capture um, uh, in follow-up visits. So whatever happens uh, in the attributes uh, uh, and the data elements, so it could be creating and entering a new, new data into the attributes of our data elements or modifying or delete. So all these are logged uh, as, um, as, as audited uh, uh, information in the DHIS2 track. So this is what is shown in these screenshots. So if someone wants to go back and see who has done some uh, uh, editing or, change, uh, or who has changed the data of a particular person, you can always go back and check. And that is available as an audit log. And also you can shift between several data entry modes depending on the program requirements and user preferences. So this comes in handy because uh, tracker is a kind of an abstract concept. It's very generic. And um, when you try to implement the DHS2 tracker, you might have to be sensitive to the user requirements uh, or the program requirements. So what we try to say is like the data entry screen of the DHS2 tracker capture, you have several um, uh, views. So for example, the commonest view that uh, comes by default is the longitudinal or timeline data entry, where you have these boxes, which are of different colors, which will, um, you will have so many boxes, uh, if uh, and one box pertaining to each of the visit, we capture data. Right? So some people may like it, but others will not like it. They will like to have a kind of a row like, uh, row by row data entry, or they might like a tabular, uh, user interface. So most of these are supported in the DHS2 tracker capture. So the typical scenario is you will have this timeline data entry, and this is what you see by default in timeline data entry, but you can change it to a different view based on the user's preference. So for example, what you're seeing here is like, again, in the same timeline data entry, but you are entering data for a one person uh, in uh, just in one row. So uh, people may find this easy when they are entering data. And this is definitely configurable in the tracker capture dash, uh, the, the, the track entity dashboard itself. Right? So uh, they can select uh, this particular view and enter data if it is more feasible to them uh, than the default um, timeline data view that is available in the tracker capture. And also if they prefer, uh, so this is again uh, demonstrating how it uh, how it is visualized when you uh, have this configuration. But if you want to have a tabular kind of uh, user interface for tracker data entry, this is also possible by enabling the tabular data entry. Right? When you enable the tabular data entry, this is how the data capture interface uh, will be visible. And again. A uh, new functionality, which has been again around for last few versions of DHIS2, is to assign the events to a particular user and enabling a custom working list for that user. So what I mean by uh, uh, assigning an event could be like, say, for example, in the laboratory. So if you are having a program, a tracker program configured for the laboratory, you might want to assign a particular lab sample to a lab user. Right. If you have five users, you might want to assign a set of uh, lab, uh, lab requests to one user, another set, uh, another set to a different user. So this is possible using the tracker capture, using this assigned user functionality as uh, seen on the screenshot number one. And the number two and three are related to having custom working lists. So for example, if uh, another person logs in and he wants to have a, I mean, uh, this is all related to the, uh, the, the listing in the tracker capture first page, right? The front page. So the front page listing, we can configure it in such a way that 
you can have a custom working list with a different layout. Um, say like we may have a default layout where we may be uh, displaying few of the attributes for all the users. But when you have a custom working list, we can define what will be the attributes or like based on a filter criteria, what are the track entities what will be displayed um, in my view. So this is what I mean by custom working list. And this is available in the DHS2 track. And again, uh, the concept which I highlighted before about relationships. So um, this relationships is, uh, uh, is a concept where we can create a link between two tracked entity instances, right? So for example, we have a person who is registered in the surveillance program and uh, we have a different program for contact tracing. And uh, we find uh, a person who is uh, already registered in the contact tracing program, and we want to create a link, say he has been in contact with, right? It is possible to create this link within the HIS2. Right? So this can come in handy, especially with the uh, uh, relationship analytics, which is being developed right now, which is still under development. So, uh, and, and even like uh, we'll be introducing you to few uh, DHS to custom applications, which have been developed by some of his organizations, which are using this relationship analytics visualization. So these could be achieved by creating the linkages between the track entity instances. And this is possible uh, uh, by using the uh, relationships functionality of DHS2. And so uh, uh, again, now we are demonstrating here how a person can be enrolled to multiple programs. So for example, if the person is already enrolled in the case-based surveillance as seen here, and we want to enroll him to the contact registration follow-up, we can just do it by clicking on add new button. Uh, so that way we'll be, uh, I mean, once that person is registered, yeah, he'll, we will be able to see that person, uh, the registered pro program as the other program. I'm not going into too much of details because uh, this will be demonstrating during our course. And of course, we can display live indicators and program data values. So what we mean by indicators, you must be familiar with the aggregate indicators in DHIS2, but uh, program indicators is a calculation that can happen real time while you are entering data. So a typical use case would be like, uh, especially when uh, if you have your date of birth, which is captured at the registration, and you want to display dynamically, once the uh, data entry user is entering data, the patient's age as of today, it could be configured in DHS2 as a program indicator, and we can display it in the indicators widget of the tracker capture or track entity dashboard, right? So these are kind of, I mean, it is, uh, it is dynamic and it will be displayed real time based on today's date. And in addition, we can schedule visits and uh, uh, track their status. So uh, as you can see here, like uh, we can see that uh, this person is having, uh, he has already had a vaccination event on September 13th, and he has a pending event, which is scheduled on, um, uh, on November 22nd. And also inside the tracker capture, we are able to uh, visualize uh, uh, what are the pending events or so scheduled events um, for vaccination, right? So that way we can um, uh, even see per person what are the future scheduled events and also like um, uh, in a kind of a list view uh, about all these uh, scheduled events and track. Another cool feature which is available in DHS2 is to send reminders based on scheduled visits. So this can happen, uh, say for example, like uh, uh, we can configure the DHIS2 in such a way, like uh, especially related to the uh, uh, program stage or event completion to send an alert then and there, right? Say for example, uh, once uh, vaccination data is captured for the dose number one, and when you click on the complete button, we can trigger an email or SMS to be sent to the person's mobile. So this is something very straightforward, which is sent as a notification real time. Or else we can uh, uh, configure it in such a way that uh, at a given time of the day, 
all the notifications will be sent as a bulk to, to the scheduled events. Uh, so this can come in handy, especially to send reminders of, uh, of upcoming events or a vaccination or some health event to the clients. And this is possible using DHIS2. And in addition, there are some functionalities to enhance the data quality while capturing your data. So as you can see in this uh, 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 screenshot and the, um, the GIF image, like uh, when the per uh, person enters uh, today's date and uh, again, yeah, today's date and uh, select the type of the vaccine, the uh, batch number and the expiry dates are automatically calculated. So this can come real handy, uh, especially to speed up the data entry process, as well as to prevent the errors that could happen at the point of data entry. So these are all configurable in DHIS2, and you can configure it the way you want. And again, we can show feedback. So this feedback could be a warning or particularly an error. So for example, you can see in this, uh, in the screenshot uh, at the bottom, you can see here in this uh, yellow color box, it says the client has received their last dose. Please consider completing the stage and program. So sometimes like we find it very difficult to make the uh, data entry user to click the uh, complete button uh, once they have entered all the data to uh, inform uh, or to officially um, agree that the data entry is complete. But uh, this is something that uh, the data entry people all uh, usually miss. So we can kind of uh, have this prompt uh, displayed where uh, they have entered the, uh, all the information. Like he has come to uh, the la la latter part of data entry screen to display a message like this. And this is again is configurable. Right. So so far we have discussed uh, features which are available in DHS to capture and DHS2 tracker capture, all in the web version of DHS2. Now let us look at what are the functionalities which are available in the DHS2 Android. So uh, this part will be done by Saurabh. So over to you, Saurabh. I will stop sharing. Thank you, Pamut, uh, for taking the first task. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, thank you again for joining the webinar. So I'll continue with the presentation for the next set of slides that we have. Uh, hope I'm uh, audible to everyone. Uh, so we'll talk about DHS to Android to start with. Uh, as uh, we've seen with the web version, the Android application works with all the three data models which are available in DHIS2. That is the aggregate data model, the events model, and the tracker data model, uh, both online and offline, depending upon the internet availability. Uh, there are some tailored user interfaces which are custom made for mobile data collection, which the implementations can take benefit out of. And more recently, there have been uh, advancement made in the Android app to support offline analytics within the tracked entity dashboard so that as the end user is reporting data, he also gets some meaningful information out of the data that the uh, user has been reporting for each patient. Uh, so this is specifically useful when you're using the Android app for collecting data for uh, longitudinal care programs. So as you see in the screenshots, uh, we you can assign various color schemes and icons to the programs. Uh, and currently in the events data model, you can always, you can use uh, simplified icon sets to capture your data for events. So in case you want pictorial collection of data, so you can associate a color and an icon with your uh, options in an option set. And you will have a, a interface which you see on the second screenshot. So you have kind of a, intuitive and pictorial data collection mechanism, uh, which also can be configured in case that is uh, required as per the program needs. 
uh, all the uh, configurations that have been done on the web are fully compatible with the Android application uh, with some considerations. So we, for the implementations who already have uh, their web systems implemented and they do plan to reach out to the community now through uh, the Android app, they should ensure that they particularly test their configurations on the Android app before they start the rollout because uh, there are some considerations which are required in terms of the program rules and the indicators when you make a switch to a hybrid mode of data collection uh, between online and offline data collection. So once you kind of test your configurations on the Android app and if few modifications might require might be required to do before you go to uh, live data collection. So the Android app will allow you to collect tracker data offline. Uh, so if you're collecting data in absence of internet connection, then there is a local database which is available in the mobile device, which keeps it, which keeps the synchronized copy, the last synchronized copy available on the web version, and it is available to the user. So anytime a user goes to the field uh, before moving out to the field, uh, through the sync function, uh, a last available copy of the records on the web instance gets downloaded to the Android device. So that if you are searching for patients uh, in absence of internet, you have access to that respective patient's data uh, already stored in your mobile device so that you can access the patient, make updates uh, offline, and then you can again, synchronize your data in presence of internet connection. So the updates could be pushed to the patients to whom you have interacted with today. So these mechanisms help you to collect data offline and then synchronize with the data available on the web server. Then one of the more, most important features is to avoid duplicate uh, beneficiary registrations. So the search uh, and the um, uh, adding new patients and searching new patients is, is part of an integrated search mechanism where before adding a new patient, you start with entering the records or entering the information for a specific person and the system or the app would run a search for you already from the existing list of patients which are available in the app. In case a uh, coincidence or coherence is found with an existing record, the app will give you the, the search result and tell you that a person with the same information is already available. But in case you realize that this person is different, then you can go ahead and uh, register the new person and all the attributes which you had filled while doing the integrated search, they are carried forward to the registration form automatically. So you can do an integrated search and register function through the mobile app. And as we saw on the web version, there is a track identity dashboard for each individual person that you are uh, tracking. Similar interface of uh, a mobile form factor of a track identity dashboard is already available where you can see the key details of the person and what all uh, events or services a person or a patient has already taken and what new visits could be added or scheduled depending upon the program workflow. Uh, in recent versions of the Android application, map views have been uh, added as a new functionality set where uh, when you are adding the coordinates for each patient you're registering, these coordinates are then plotted on the map and you see these icons representing each patient. So you can collect the spatial information in two ways. One is through coordinates of each patient, or you can also capture polygons. So you can see uh, the patients which are captured in a specific polygon or a specific area. And you can even see the pinpoint location of each patient where the person was registered. So during the community outreach or you're doing community programs, you can capture the residential location of each patient and you can even uh, um, analyze the data as per the location and more recently the google maps uh, app has also been integrated so in case you are on the field and you want to know the uh, estimated distance between your location and the beneficiary's location then you can always do a search and the app will take you 
to Google Maps and it will give you an estimated distance between your present location and the beneficiary's location. So uh, these use cases, these requirements were uh, critically reported during the COVID times when, uh, for example, for HIV patients, the patients couldn't visit the health facility for their ART fill pickup. So these functionalities were quickly developed and added so that wherever in the implementations we were using Android devices, the health workers could reach each beneficiary and can make use of the integration with the Google Maps a functionality to live use to see the distance between them and the, the beneficiaries' residents. Uh, the uh, Android app allows you to take pictures uh, and store them against the data elements. Uh, but you can also uh, search or read QR codes and barcodes, and you can use them as unique data points for beneficiaries, or you can capture them as information for uh, maintaining stocks for different batches with so different use cases where you can use these QR codes and barcodes. Uh, we kind of used these, these functionalities in registering patients uh, through their existing uh, master patient index card where they had a QR code with all their information. So it was used to read patient information from existing health cards or, or national ID cards. And even the use case also applies to various LMIS context where you can scan the batches or barcodes of each commodity and make a record of it. So this particular feature can be used as a unique attribute to search or read data for a specific patient or a commodity. In terms of the interface, there are different rendering types available. Uh, so when you create a drop-down menu or in the HSO terminology, what we, what we call as an option set, uh, you can render the option set uh, or a drop-down menu into different ways. It could be horizontal radio buttons, could be vertical radio buttons, could be horizontal checkboxes or vertical checkboxes. So there are multiple options available in which the options can be aligned. Uh, there are some uh, considerations here that uh, you need to have a maximum number of options so that the interface doesn't get cluttered when you are arranging them by horizontal or vertically. So you need to take uh, uh, things into consideration that your option set should not be a very long list of uh, drop down items so that uh, um, it, it doesn't really kind of looks more uh, less intuitive or less user friendly. So these functionalities are available, but uh, the use depends upon the use case and, and uh, the desired uh, outcome which is required out of these functionalities. Uh, then, as we saw uh, in the web working list, we have uh, a custom working list filters available in the Android application where you can filter your records by different dates, by org units, by user assignment, by their uh, uh, completion status. So there are multiple filters available by which you can create your working list. So if on the Android application, I want to see that next week uh, to how many pregnant females I have to visit and do home ANC visits. So you can put filters uh, in terms of uh, visits scheduled for ANC and you can put a date filter and it will give you a filtered list of uh, beneficiaries or patients, those uh, you're supposed to visit and uh, collect data and provide services. Uh, so you can create custom working list in the, in the Android application. Then, as I said, uh, mentioned before, there are the, there are new developments being done to support local offline analytics in the TEI dashboard. So you can have a look at key indicators, either as single value items, or you can see charts to see the evolution of data elements in form of bar charts, line charts, and more particularly, the use case is more suited to child growth, where you're collecting parameters like weight and height. And you can calculate these uh, anthropometric measures like Z-scores for all the variables, uh, weight, height, and age. And those could be, those could be used to, uh, to plot the data uh, on the local devices. So you can always see the progression of uh, child's age through the anthropometric measures. But you can also plot the um, um, 
different variables for say NCD like blood sugar, blood pressure. So any value which you're capturing, it could be plotted into different forms and it could be utilized for measuring the progress of the patient across the different important key indicators that you want to track for that specific person. So more and more features are being brought in to uh, make the device more handy for a health worker to analyze the patient's data and make uh, useful decisions out of the data uh, which is being captured. Then after Android, we come to the visualization tools. Uh, as most of us who are familiar with DHIS2 are aware of the visualization modules which are available. So we have a data visualizer which allows us to create uh, different kinds of charts and uh, the pivot table is now also available as a chart type within the data visualizer app. Then you have event visualizer and event reports, which allow you to analyze data for different events. Uh, and then we have the maps app, which allows you to plot data spatially, both as thematic layers, as heat maps. And you can also use event clusters if you're collecting coordinate based information for events and enrollments. So we would be covering uh, in the academy uh, the apps which are helpful to do analysis of tracker and events data. So these sessions will be taken in detail. So if you are uh, uh, planning to visualize tracker data, then one is collecting individual information and using individual information for making decisions. But of course, when it comes to program level monitoring and evaluation, we do need aggregated summaries of the tracker data. So you can create program indicators, which are basically your aggregations of the case based data which you're collecting. And you can also create detailed line, line list reports where you can select, pick and choose your variables from the event reports app and create your line list for the, the variables which you want to plot and generate a register for each uh, specific program or a program stage. Then we have uh, uh, from the option sets or the drop down menus or the coded values that we collect through our data input screens, we can uh, very easily visualize the standardized responses. So, for example, um, the example which has been shown here is for COVID vaccination. So, there are different uh, uh, candidates available for uh, COVID vaccines, uh, which have, are being produced by different manufacturers. So, if you want to see the consumption of different COVID vaccines by their manufacturers, then you could very easily aggregate this data and put that data in form of charts and tables uh, through uh, creating these program indicators. So the more codified data you collect, the more easier it becomes to analyze that information by aggregating that information um, for uh, consumption, for uh, uh, making decisions. So you can create indicators uh, through both tracker and aggregate data. So that is what we call is integrated analytics, where your, for example, you want to create coverage indicators for COVID vaccination, and you want to see the coverage of uh, vaccination across health workers, across frontline workers, across general population. So your population data or your denominators come from the aggregate data model while your tracker uh, data model will give you the sum of doses given by each respective uh, uh, person category. So there you're using two different data models and you're combining that to build your indicators, which can give you your rates and proportions and coverage indicators uh, based on the requirements of the program. So within the same report, you can triangulate the data coming from tracker and you can pull in the data from the aggregate uh, data sets and you can generate your outputs and, and use them in your uh, analytics. So for example, if you see these, uh, the pivot table, which is shown below. So the people receiving first dose, so age 35 to 34, this is coming from uh, the tracker data model where we are combining the patients who were given the first dose and who belong to the age group between 35 to 54. And then we have the population estimate stored in a data set 
uh, in terms of the eligible people under this age group who uh, are eligible for getting vaccinated. And then we are combining these two, uh, this program indicator and this data element to create a indicator to give you the value for dose coverage amongst 35 to 54 years of uh, age bracket based on the uh, eligible population. So like this, you can combine the information from uh, different data models to do integrated analytics. Then uh, from your raw data which you're collecting, you can apply different disaggregations. Depending upon the program, you can create multiple disaggregations of age group and gender, for example. So you can create these flexible age bands through legend sets. So you can either have an age band which kind of uh, aggregates uh, patients into information such as 0 to 4, 5 to 14, 15 to 24. And the same information can also be presented into a different age band, 0 to 5, 6 to 11, 12 to 17. So it depends upon uh, the age brackets which you want to create. Uh, you can create different age brackets and analyze the same information in different ways. So these, this is the flexible disaggregations which are available, which can be applied to the, the raw data which you're collecting. Then uh, through the new event reports, uh, which was introduced from version 2.34, uh, the support for enrollment analytics was also added. Earlier, the event reports only used to show data for individual events, but from 2.34 onwards, you have enrollment analytics also added to the event reports where you can pull data from different program stages into a single event report. For example, we are creating a summary table here for uh, COVID patients, where from stage one, we are capturing data for their underlying conditions. From stage three, lab result, we are collecting the type of test that we did, type of sample that was taken. And from stage four, we're collecting the health outcomes. So from different stages, we are selecting our data elements and we are combining them together into a consolidated line list. So this, these uh, uh, consolidated tables can now be created in event reports by selecting different data elements belonging to different stages. Mm -hmm. Then we spoke about the maps application. So the maps application would allow you to plot data both uh, as an aggregate layer, that is a thematic layer, uh, to generate uh, heat maps but you can also track your individual data by creating these location-based clusters. So when you're creating your program indicators for uh, seeing the total cases or total people vaccinated, then you can create these thematic layers and uh, to see the data for the totals. But in case you're capturing coordinates for each event or each enrollment, then you can create these clusters, which are basically a congregation of all the patients who share similar locations uh, through the coordinates. And then we create these clusters. So these clusters would show you the total number of events which have happened in that specific location, uh, over which you can also add filters. You can only see male events. You can only see female events. So you can do that. And you can also create these combined clusters to see the proportion uh, of cases by uh, the specified type. So if you're seeing by gender, then it will give you a, a proportion distribution between the male and the female cases. And, it, and if you want to see by any specific filter, which involves uh, option set or, or uh, uh, a drop-down menu, then those disaggregations would be plotted as clusters as well. So it could be whole clusters where you just see the total number and you can uh, disaggregate or you can drill down to uh, an individual patient or it could be donut-like clusters which give you a breakup between different uh, drop-down options available. So both the mechanisms are possible here to analyze the data uh, for tracker programs. Then of course as we saw uh, yesterday in our webinar uh, uh, in many of the implementations, uh, the cluster maps uh, were put into use. So for uh, Nepal, for the HIV use case, we saw the biometric application is a cluster map, which is being used with the DHIS to track a capture 
uh, in Lao, we saw the use of um, uh, QR codes and generating vaccine certificates that was done as a customer. And similarly, as we see here in Vanatu, we are using a custom app to generate the COVID vaccine certification uh, for the beneficiaries who have uh, taken the vaccines. So uh, in terms of the platform, the THIS2 platform and tracker capture are both extensible. You can make use of the existing setup to build more apps and integrate those apps with the core data model so that your custom requirements can also be fulfilled along with the basic use case of data collection and management for any health or non-health uh, um, use case. Uh, so this, these are few examples where these custom apps were developed, uh, which were required to carry out more detailed analysis of COVID-19 data. So the COVID-19 relationship uh, uh, relationships is a custom web app, which is available on the DHS2 app hub. Uh, the concept was to uh, link the, the index case and the various COVID contacts available and then creating such network diagrams to see that uh, for one specific case ID, uh, what was the case type, uh, where the case was located and to how many people the case was connected to uh, in terms of the contacts. And, and there are algorithms which show you uh, the different dimensions of closeness, betweenness and uh, the scores. So these are some custom applications which were developed by our partners uh, at uh, Public Health Institute in Norway and even History Lanka and uh, the, the his teams uh, developed a similar application for uh, doing the COVID-19 relationship tracing where we could see uh, each individual index case and to how many index case was this contact, uh, to how many contacts was this index case linked to. And you could even see the index case, the details, and you could go back to tracker capture and see the additional details of this respective index case. So these functionalities are not part of the core as of now, uh, but depending upon the situation and the requirements and the criticality of, of certain use cases, web apps are being uh, developed uh, more uh, recently, which work in interaction with the DHIS2 databases. And moving forward, these functionalities are always put on the roadmap to make them as core features so that uh, within the default product, these functionalities are available for people to utilize for different use cases. Now we come to the other side of things where we talk about more uh, more of continuous improvements that we are making to the DHIS2 framework. The team at Oslo uh, has set up a performance unit, which basically works largely uh, taking help from larger implementations to analyze uh, different parameters and how the system is uh, performing and how the system is behaving to larger data sets. So the new tracker data importer has been optimized uh, to kind of cater large sets of data import into uh, the system. Uh, the tracker search engine has been revamped. There are a lot of improvements being made to kind of, which are basically at the backend level where the code has been uh, written smartly, the redundancies have been removed. The query optimizations have been done with respect to the database. The indexing patterns have been changed and the database locks and contention improvements have been made over time to ensure that in use cases such as COVID vaccinations or COVID surveillance or routine disease surveillance where you deal with lakhs and lakhs of cases, the system response is as fast as required by the end user to keep using the system in real time and not really use it as a secondary mode of data entry when he's kind of maintaining things on paper and then again doing the data entry at the end of the day. So to avoid that double um, uh, burden on the health workers, uh, const continuous improvements are being made to uh, improve the performance of uh, the tracker. Uh, then the API usage uh, in the new tracker app, which we'll just see on the next slides, is, is being uh, revamped to kind of uh, save the entire event. So right now, when we use track capture, we see that each field that we fill, it turns green. That means each value is saved separately. But in the new track, the new capture app, 
which will include the tracker model also, you'll see that the entire event will be saved at once so that the frequent interactions with the database are kept as minimal as possible. Uh, from version 2.34, these uh, enhancements were rolled out for the community. And this is just a, a diagram which shows the response times between the version 2.3, 3.2.3, 4.3 and 2.3, So the red um, uh, bar that you see is uh, the uh, time taken, the response time in these different uh, functions that the system performs on users' commands has been reduced significantly as compared to the 2.3, 4.3. So these uh, enhancements have been taken uh, up from 2.34 and they are part of the latest releases, for example, 2.36 right now. So it has been suggested for all organizations, all countries planning uh, large tracker implementations to, to stay close to the latest uh, DHS2 version so that they can benefit out of the performance improvements that have been made out in the latest releases. Uh, then we have started with uh, planning the upcoming features in a much better way. Uh, we are working with the team at Oslo where we are organizing these feature prioritization workshops where each of us, his groups work, who continuously work with ministries of health and the partner organizations are giving our priorities to the developers at University of Oslo. And they are kind of building a DHS roadmap, which has a score for each prioritization, uh, each priority or each feature request that uh, has come from different haste groups. And the higher the score, the earlier the functionality would get implemented into the upcoming releases. Uh, we, the team at Oslo is working on building a schematic for DHS2 uh, development in terms of the roadmap and the features which are covered in that specific release. So it would be open to public very soon where they could see the different features which are planned in each release so that they could plan their implementations and their upgradations accordingly, depending upon the release of those specific features that they're looking for. Uh, a new event reports app is under development. Uh, right now, there are user experience managers and DHS2 experts at Oslo and representative from his groups who are working with uh, the development team to design uh, different uh, wireframes and uh, creating a functionality stack where the event reports app is kind of uh, being revamped to give a more modern user experience and more similar look and feel as a visualizer app so that all the apps look uh, on the same uh, uh, user interface, the same UI. Uh, and we are also trying to work on integrating uh, cross-program analytics. So right now, when we do analysis of tracker data, it is restricted to one program. So we can, we can either uh, see data for HIV program or TB program. Uh, but um, uh, moving forward, uh, we would be able to see cross-program analytics where I can see if the pa same patients are enrolled in the HIV program and the TV, TB program, so we can see data across uh, programs. Then we have uh, the uh, event reports. So this is the, the wireframe diagram of the new event reports app where uh, you can see that you will be able to select your program dimensions from the left hand side and the main dimensions which is select for org unit and programs and you can see the time dimension in terms of what dates you want to utilize for uh, your analysis then you'll have a similar interface as you see in the new visualizer app where you can drag and drop your dimensions and you can select your input dimension selections from the left hand side menu Now we also are working towards the release of the new tracker uh, uh, web app. So as Pamot showed in the beginning that we do have a capture app now, which is basically being utilized for, um, for event data collection, but now that is being scaled over to tracker data collection as well. So we have the main themes which are covered in this new capture app for tracker. 
are the tracked entity centric dashboard, which would be cross program. So we'll have a person summary dashboard, which will have information, key information for that person across programs. So if I'm enrolled in HIV, TB and diabetes programs, for example, then all the key parameters which are covered in each program uh, for me would be shown to the clinician or to the end user so that they could see an overall picture of my enrollments in the system in different programs. Uh, the duplicate record handling is being improved. We are also working on use cases where batch entry is required, where same set of information needs to be added for different patients. So that use case is also being taken into account. This is more for the education use case that we have recently been working with, where you have similar data to be reported for multiple students. So we require a batch entry. So that use case is also being taken into account for in the new tracker app that is being developed. You can filter the organity by different programs. Uh, the performance and the user experience are the key parameters which have been taken into account in developing the new app. So these are some of the screenshots of the new app, which is expected to be out for use from version 2.37. Uh, till uh, next few releases, both the apps would be available for consumption because it would take some time for the users to get transitioned to the new app. So it would involve a lot of capacity building effort. So keeping that in mind, uh, the, both the apps would function. But uh, given the rich features which the new app will present to the end users and the program managers, we kind of uh, expect that we will see the transition from the old app to the new app in coming years. So this is the person dashboard, which gives you information for different programs, uh, where at all the information for this person has been captured along with the person's image. If there are any notes which have been added in different programs, such as key information, such as allergies, uh, my past history, or anything which a clinician should know who has been interacting with the person for the first time, then you see that in the notes section and any relationships which exist across programs, they're listed here on the right hand side, Richard. Then we have the enrollment dashboard for the program where you could see the different uh, stages that have been created for this specific person. And we now have a dedicated sidebar which will show you the feedback which is coming through the program rules, which could be errors or warnings. Uh, any feedback which you have been set in the program rules, uh, indicators for BMI or any indicators which you create uh, for monitoring the key parameters of each patient and the person profile. So you can create different events for each program stage, and these are now bundled together uh, uh, in the person dashboard. So giving you a look at the latest program stages or latest visits for each program stage which have happened, and total how many events have happened for lab monitoring, how many overdue, how many are scheduled, and when was the last update made. So this. Uh, this particular uh, 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 user interface will now be introduced in the new capture app for uh, maintaining data for each person. So this would be the new person, uh, the person's enrollment dashboard with the data for stages and events. Uh, the duplicates would be handled much better now. So while you're registering a person into the program, you'll see the details of that uh, the potential duplicates which are there for that respective person and you can also view the dashboard and the programs in which the person is already enrolled so that you can decide that whether this is already an existing person which you're trying to add uh, so that you can stop there and review the person record which is already existing or you always have the option to save this as a new person and the enrollment in the program that you're trying to do that. So this would be how the duplicates would be handled in the new capture app. So again, on the top, you'll see uh, that this record could be a possible duplicate of another person. Uh, when you are, you'll have functionalities to flag duplicate records and you'll see the flag over on the top. And if you find out eventually that the person is not a duplicate, you can always mark this person as a unique. So a lot of uh, features which were missing from the old tracker capture app and the technology stack was uh, was old enough to not 
do any updates to the old tracker rapture app hence a completely new version on the latest technology stack is being will be rolled out pretty soon so that the community can take advantage of of uh, the new functionalities and the new user interface Then, as I mentioned, it will allow you to do nine listing data entry. So, in the traditional tracker capture app, which we use right now, we see most of our data entry mechanisms are from top to bottom. But here, you can also do left to right data entry, depending upon how your program is designed and the number of data elements which are there. So, depending upon, you can uh, uh, configure your uh, uh, view modes and you can enter data accordingly. Uh, whichever mode is convenient for the end user to do uh, to enter the data for. Uh, we have seen many large scale implementations in last couple of years. Uh, to name a few, the MR immunization campaign for measles and rubella that happened in Bangladesh, where 400,000 sites and 35 million vaccinations happened, where each child was registered and vaccinated. Sri Lanka COVID vaccination program was one of the, the national implementations where 60,000 doses or patients were registered each day and 16 million people were tracked uh, for their COVID vaccination. Rwanda did a similar implementation for COVID case surveillance where 1.5 million people were registered and the COVID vaccination was at a much larger scale where 100,000 people per day were getting registered and these are the specific targets which the program has set. So the stories for these uh, implementations have been given on the DHS2 website. The links are embedded here. Uh, the presentation will be shared with you so you can review these stories and see how these implementations have been our uh, testing areas to learn from these implementations on the performance enhancements which are required in DHS2 and what lessons we learned out of these implementations are now getting implemented uh, in the new versions to uh, uh, enrich the functionalities of the software moving forward. Uh, deduplication was an important piece which was missing in the, uh, the old, the traditional tracker capture app that we're currently using. So, uh, process is already under place to kind of have a fuzzy search and matching mechanism to identify the duplicate records and have algorithms which could match the values across the combination of different attributes. So name, age, sex, date of birth, mobile number. So a combination of these attributes can will be matched to identify potential duplicates. And a background job is being developed, which would help you to give kind of a report that these are the potential duplicates that have been identified across the programs and uh, how these uh, duplicates can be merged. So we could, uh, there would be two options available where we would suggest candidates for automatic merge, and then you'll have options to manually control the merging of identified uh, duplicate records. So these are some of the enhancements which are being uh, uh, planned uh, over the next few releases. So this was the last slide of the, the presentation. Uh, if there are any questions, uh, please feel free to put them in the chat box. You can also leave questions on the Academy Slack channel under the questions channel. We could take up those questions uh, across uh, the Academy uh, next week when we cover specific topics related to traffic use. Uh, but if there are any questions right now, we do have some time to take those questions and, and do further discussions if there are any queries or uh, any feedback which, which needs to be shared. So thank you for your patient listening. Uh, I'll have a look at the chat box if there are any questions. Uh, uh, no, I don't see any questions right now. Uh, do we have any questions? Okay, so in case we do not have any questions now, I think we've almost reached the end time of the webinar. Uh, uh, so again, I would request you to put questions on the Academy Slack channel and we will be happy to answer them there. And once again, thank you for attending the webinar today.
uh, and we look forward to your participation. Um, we look forward to your participation uh, in the academy beginning Monday, where we'll take you to the the onboarding process and the uh, the introductory uh, sessions on on the track to use training. Uh, so we have one question on cohort analysis from Tracker. Uh, yes, so um, uh, in program indicators now we have uh, boundaries available where you can define your cohorts uh, through the use of uh, uh, boundaries. So you can define the, the patients that you're looking for. For example, if you're tracking your tuberculosis patients, then you can create a cohort of the people who were registered during quarter one last year and what has been their outcome in the same quarter next year. So you can create your boundaries when you're creating your program indicators. And when you select your analysis time periods, then it will give you the number of patients based on the boundaries that you have defined. So the session on creating these program indicators uh, is part of the Tracker Configuration Academy uh, that is due in December. So you, uh, you are more than have, welcome to uh, join that academy and this particular use case for cohort analysis is covered in a very detailed manner in the program indicator section in the tracker configuration course. Okay, uh, so I don't see any more questions. So uh, I think we can end the webinar for the day and uh, we look forward to meeting you guys on Monday when the academy starts. So thank you very much for your time today and have a good day ahead.